C Corp can have a stock option plan. Uh, it can have a foreign shareholder. Uh, an unlimited number of shareholder uh, C Corp can have. Make sure that you're hiring an employee and not, um, uh, you, you don't interchange that with an independent contractor. When you are a seller in that company, you know, you want to do it as a stock sale because the way the US tax setup is done, you know, when you do a stock transaction, that taxation is low. So you get a preferential treatment, which is a capital gain tax treatment. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Thai. We've had the pleasure of being associated with Thai uh, since inception, and we've enjoyed our association with Thai. Uh, it's one of the best things we've ever done in life, and I hope uh, all of you stay actively involved with Thai. Uh, it's the only platform that connects the South Asians around the world uh, together. We feel like a community, partly because of Thai. So our firm is 35 years old. We do corporate work, tax work, litigation, immigration, employment, M&A, divorces. Uh, and uh, basically, if you're in business or otherwise you have any issues, uh, we have solutions. And we try to be the general counsel and CFO for all of our clients. So we have a wonderful team assembled for you today. Uh, We'll answer all of your questions for free. If you call us, we charge you, but today everything is free. So um, I will uh, ask each one of the panelists to introduce themselves. So that'll save time uh, and I'll just name them and they get to introduce themselves and we'll give them 30 seconds. And then I have a question. Let me start with uh, Ramesh Patel. He's a senior CPA partner with the firm has been an anchor of the firm for 25 years. So Ramesh, tell us about your life and also tell us that a person wants to start a business and there's so many options, so proprietorship, partnership, corporation, S corporation, LLC, LLP, what is one person supposed to do? Hi everyone, uh, this is uh, Ramesh Patel. Uh, I'm a senior CPA partner uh, based out of Los Angeles office. Uh, been with the firm for the last uh, 25 years. Uh, I primarily practice uh, uh, taxes, uh, which include the federal, multi-state, international for businesses and individuals. Uh, as far as the type of tax, I do handle the direct and indirect taxes. Uh, with regard to the like, you know, the which uh, type of entity uh, to uh, to choose. Uh, uh, so, as far as uh, uh, sole proprietor and partnership are concerned, uh, I, we don't recommend that mainly due to the liability exposure. Uh, for real estate investment, uh, LLC is ideal uh, uh, for real estate investment. Uh, limited liability part uh, partnership, which is LLP, uh, ideal for professional like attorneys and CPAs. Uh, there is another form of uh, entity uh, which uh, uh, businesses can have is S corporation. Uh, it's preferred for a small operating business uh, mainly because of the single level taxes. Uh, company do not pay the tax, but the owner pay the tax. But uh, as far as the uh, IT and technology companies are concerned, and uh, most of you guys are in, uh, in, the, in those uh, industry, I think the C corporation is ideal, uh, even though it has a double taxation uh, because uh, most VCs and uh, investors prefer uh, C corp, uh, mainly because of the preferred share preference they have. Uh, C Corp can have a stock option plan. Uh, it can have a foreign shareholder uh, and unlimited number of shareholder uh, C Corp can have. Upon exit, uh, if there is a stock sale, then under section 1202, uh, company, uh, sorry, the, uh, the shareholder can exclude the 100% gain uh, as long as you qualify for the definition of the 1202. And there is another code section under 1045, you can roll over the capital gain to another company you start. And uh, as far as the stock losses, if, in case there is a, uh, like, you know, the uh, losses upon uh, closure of the company, that normally is a capital losses, which uh, taxpayer can write off uh, $3,000 per year. Uh, but uh, if you, uh, qualified uh, uh, section 1244, then up to $50,000 for a single filer and uh, for joint uh, filer up to $100,000, uh, you can uh, write off as uh, ordinary losses. 
So there is no cap of three thousand dollars per year limit. Uh, over to you, Navin. Okay, thank you. So let's go to Kisle. Kisle. Um, so we have an entity now. Uh, so now I want to give stocks to my employees. What should I do? Should I do a stock option plan? Should I give ISOs, NSOs, restricted stock? What should I do? Thanks, Navneet. Uh, first, I'll tell about my life in 30 seconds. Hello, everyone. My name is Kislai, and I'm a CPA and partner at uh, Santa Clara office of the firm. I am uh, privileged of doing and learning about the business since I was 10 years old. I did the business for almost 11 years before I moved on for my chartered accountancy. After doing CA in India, I came to US and I have been practicing tax, advisory, MA, and audit for 20 plus years. I strongly feel that based on my unique experience, I understand client problem better. Lastly, I focus more on providing solutions than, than I focus on the problem. Regarding your questions, Navneet, definitely uh, you should have a stock option plan, especially if you want to put uh, employees on the vesting schedule. It's a very big topic, but I'll try to summarize in few points. The public company generally gives RSUs, the startups and private companies typically use all three ISO, NSOs, and restricted stocks. Restricted stocks are the best options, but generally given to only founders and key executives. They can do 83 v election and they can pay the tax only at the time of final sale or exit. ISOs are the second best options. Employees can avoid uh, the ordinary income tax upon exercise. If they have ISOs, but the delta between fair market value and the grant price could be subject to uh, AMT tax. And lastly, NSOs are, are generally the last choice as uh, it attracts tax as, as, as a ordinary income upon exercise. Note that if you have a third party consultant, uh, then you cannot give them ISOs, uh, then uh, you, can, you can give it to uh, NSOs to them. Okay, thank you, Kisle. Let's do a bit of immigration since we're in Silicon Valley and 42% of the people living in Silicon Valley are from outside of Silicon Valley. So let's go to Kirti, our immigration specialist. So Kirti, I think if I say that if I'm a citizen or a green card holder, I can start a company, I think there should be no issues with that. Uh, but what if I'm on H1, what if I'm on L1, what if I'm a tourist from B1, can I start a company? Well, uh, thanks for the question, Amit. Um, uh, just to introduce myself, I'm a partner out of our Santa Clara office. Um, my primary uh, field of law that I practice is employment-based immigration. Well, to address your question, Amit, um, uh, those were a lot of different visas, but let's start with F1. Um, F1 visa, it's, it's possible to start your own business uh, on your post-completion OPT uh, period. Um, you, you would have to demonstrate that your company that you're starting is within the field, um, field of your study. Uh, you'd have to get that approved by your DSO. And then once it's approved, you'd apply for an EAD card. But the question is what happens once your, um, a student visa is up and your, uh, practice is finished, then you have to come out a way to transition your business out, either have us partners or whatnot, because. Uh, then you're going to have to transfer into a new visa. And one of those options, the most common options are H-1Bs. Um, the problem with H-1Bs is with the exception of being a passive investor, it is highly unlikely that you could start your own business on that visa. It would be difficult, if not impossible, to demonstrate that within your own company that you have the employer-employee relationship that's necessary for that visa. So, um, that, that's why starting on F and staying on H later, it becomes a normally a difficult task. But if you are a dependent to an H-1B uh, employer, um, employee in the United States, uh, say on your H-4 and you get an EAD, you can start your business without any restrictions. Um, the other visa you mentioned was the L-1A. Um, Yes, under the L1A new petition, you can start a new business, um, given that you already have an established foreign-based business that is looking to start a new branch or office in the United States. 
um, and, and that you can meet the visa requirements. Otherwise, you know, you have to be an executive manager and whatnot to start it. Again, the dependent visa to L1, the L2, if you get an employment authorization card, you can do whatever you want without restrictions. Uh, last one, uh, the B1 uh, tourist visa. I would say don't even try, uh, simply because the the B visa, the B visa for business purposes is meant to further the business of the foreign entity. And uh, the only thing you could possibly do for a new business in the United States is set it up, um, open an office, look for a lease. But you could do that from overseas anyway with, with the virtual world right now. You don't need to be physically present anymore. So um, with that said, that's kind of um, your option with those visas. Thank you, Kitty. Uh, so Jamin, let's go to you in Atlanta. Uh, since most of our clients and most of Silicon Valley largely is services business, and with services business, the only asset and product we have is employees, which means that uh, we end up in a lot of employment issues. And just with our practice as well, uh, of the 500 litigations we are handling, half of them are employment related. So you're an employment lawyer. lawyer. I've started a company, listened to Ramesh, and I did a C Corp. And I listened to Kisley and I've given stock options and uh, listened to Keithy and made sure everybody had a visa. Now, what few things I need to worry about when I hire employees? Thanks, Navneet, for the question. So just uh, by way of a quick introduction, um, I've uh, been at the firm for about nine years now, and I lead the legal team in Atlanta where we support companies with uh, general counsel services, as you mentioned, um, with employment, corporate transactional, and litigation. So. Um, uh, just to, to uh, quickly clarify, um, you're hiring an employee, but make sure that you're hiring an employee and not, um, uh, you, you don't interchange that with an independent contractor. So there's about 15, 20 factors that are used in determining whether a worker is an independent contractor or an employee. And I use the example often with clients of uh, you're, you've got a leaky faucet at your home and you're calling a plumber to fix the leak. Um, you've got a temporary worker that's coming to complete a specific role. So make sure that the level of instruction or if you're providing them training, uh, you've got control over their hiring and supervising flexibility of their schedule uh, or what tools and materials they're using. Those types of um, factors will determine whether you're classifying the worker correctly, which is important uh, to the Department of Labor. So let's say to your question of need about um, hiring an employee, um, while well, the, the company is anxious to bring in the talent, uh, be careful that not, they're not violating any restrictive covenants that the employee may have previously signed uh, with potential competitors or other companies in the area. And uh, once, uh, once that's clear, when you decide to hire an employee, understanding the expectations um, in an offer letter and employment agreement is, is uh, key. Uh, since employment is generally at will, which means that uh, either party can terminate the employment relationship at any time with or without notice. And the, the offer letter and employment agreement will discuss the contingencies that need to occur uh, whether they'll get stock options, when they'll be paid, having commission, et cetera. And um, during the course of employment, the uh, employee handbook is key as it, you know, not only discusses the missions and values of the company, but more importantly, the anti-discrimination policy, anti-harassment, and zero tolerance if anything happens. Uh, protection, protection of your, um, you know, hard uh, earned and, and uh, uh, thought of IP uh, assure that the non-compete and non-solicitation clauses and ownership of IP clauses are applicable and binding. Um, there's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, it has to be narrowly tailored um, and it's governed by state law. Right, back to you, Navneet. Thank you, Jamin. So one of the important topics going on right now is uh, what is the government done for uh, all the businesses because of COVID? And we've made a list of 25 things that state and federal governments from tax point of view, payroll uh, protection point of view, loan points of view. We prepared a list of 25 things that the government is doing. Please send us an email and we'll send you this list of 25. Out of this list of 25, let's cover two most important ones, the SBA loans and PPP loans. And for that, let's go to Satya Yeruba, a partner in charge of our Washington DC office. Satya. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Satya Yeruba. I'm CPA based out of uh, two firms, uh, Washington DC office. Uh, I'm a chart accountant from India and a CPA here in US, uh, practicing for more than six years now, for now in US. So to go back to question, uh, yeah, there are uh, quite a few uh, 
uh, financial assistance programs that are offered by the government. And out of that, we will discuss two mainly. Uh, one is Paychex Protection Program, and uh, second one is Economic Injury Disaster Loan. So Paycheck Protection Program, most of you might have uh, already heard about it. Uh, that was ended on August 8th, and the government and uh, banks have already distributed uh, $525 billion. And now it's time for uh, forgiveness application. So any of you um, have already borrowed these funds, um, please uh, get ready for uh, preparation of uh, application as well as the preparation of the documents. Uh, so that is uh, one of the important last step in getting uh, an 100% forgiveness of the loan. So, and uh, there is uh, some news going on uh, uh, regarding the default forgiveness for the loans of less than $150,000. Uh, please keep checking out uh, the news and uh, if once final rule, uh, rules have come out, then probably you may need not uh, apply for the forgiveness. And uh, second one is uh, economic injury disaster loan. Uh, this is still going on. Uh, unlike PPB, this is kind of a actual loan with a 3.75% interest rate and with repayable period of uh, 30 years. So if uh, certain conditions are met, uh, you, are, you may be eligible for uh, uh, application of this ADL loan. So see the conditions and um, if at all, uh, if you are eligible, you can apply for that. So there are a lot of uh, some other programs that are available, but due to limitation of time, I'm not going to cover it. You can feel free to contact us at any point of time. We'll provide more information. Thank you. Norman. Thank you, Satya. Very good. Uh, thank you for all of you for helping uh, about 500 clients get PPP loans of about $500 million. Great job, everyone. Uh, okay, so I've worked very hard and built a business and now my exit is finally happening the $10 million check we've all been waiting for. Uh, what should I do? Should I just sell my company? Should I sell the stock in my company? Should I sell the assets? What do I do with my India outfit, my India subsidiary? Let's ask all of these questions to our CPA partner, head of our Atlanta CPA practice, Kapil Handa. Kapil. Thank you, Namit. Hello, everyone. Just a brief background about myself. I'm a CPA partner with the firm more than 11 plus years and been helping clients with their taxation, mostly uh, multi-state US tax, their audit work. I consider myself to be a part-time CFO of our clients where they have any problem from very basic to exiting uh, and making a multi-million dollar exit. We help them with that. So that's about me. Now coming back to the question, Again, you know, when somebody's uh, built a business, it's a, it's a, I'm blessed that uh, we have these questions many, many times over from our clients because we have seen their journey where they start from one small startup and then they end up writing a $10 million check. So I think in this case, what we see when you are a seller in that company, you know, you want to do it as a stock sale because the way the US tech setup is done, you know, when you do a stock transaction that taxation is low. So you get a preferential treatment, which is a capital gain tax treatment. Whereas if you are the buyer, you know, you actually want to do an asset purchase. Why? Because when you do asset purchase, you are able to get a more step up basis in the company. I'll give you a very brief example. Let's take an example, a company you started, you have a million dollar equity in the company. Now you're selling it for $10 million. So we all know there's a $9 million capital gain tax setting. So we can pay that tax and move on. But if I'm a buyer and if I'm doing a stock purchase, then I just get a million dollar to start with in my books. And I cannot step up my basis of those $9 million gain. I would have to actually wait till the time I actually further sell that company to somebody else. So that's the reason I don't want to do a stock purchase, but I rather want to do asset purchase. But the good news is there's an election which IRS has given us, which is called 338H10 election, which both buyer and seller needs to agree. And once they agree, then the good news is the seller can treat that transaction as a stock sale, whereas as a buyer can treat that transaction as an asset purchase. So it makes both the parties happy and both have to agree. The only one caveat is the the buyer needs to buy 80% of the seller stock within 12 months. 
So that's pretty much what it is. But yeah, and the last question is if you have some setup in India today, in today's world, you know, having a setup in India is a blessing because a lot of people, a lot of companies, we all know Amazons of the world, they're all going towards India. So it's a very good, even if your seller is trying to sell the company in the US, and if the buyer says that you have even a setup in India, actually they are more inclined to buy your company. But given the taxation laws in India, they would have to pay the capital gain tax for the India tax laws. So that's about it. Thank you, Nanveet. Back to you. Okay, great. So uh, now we're uh, happy to take any questions from the audience. And uh, while we're waiting for questions, does anybody, while you were talking because of the short time, is there anything you left out that you want to uh, cover and finish? Satya, how do we get the loan forgiven now, now that we got the loan? What do we have to do? Uh, so for the loans with uh, above $150,000, uh, a lot of banks have started taking the applications. Uh, so uh, uh, we would recommend you to check with the bank and see if they're, uh, uh, they have started accepting the application. If that is the case, then uh, we need to prepare the application with all the supporting documents. So. Uh, in the it's an 11-page application. Uh, uh, so for some of the businesses, it probably may be easy, but uh, uh, especially those businesses um, with fewer employees than pre-COVID-19 levels, uh, we have to uh, do a bit of calculation with regard to the um, full-time equivalent employees. So basically, uh, rule says is um, uh, you have to maintain the save, save level of employees say, as of uh, pre-COVID-19 level period. So if, if any business has fewer than those number of employees, we need to see the calculation. And still there are some safe harbor um, uh, rules that are applicable, but uh, that is one area I, I, uh, I think each borrower has to look into it carefully and uh, before applying for the forgiveness. Okay. Yeah. So Kirti, the number one question we get in our offices is that, hey, my green card is stuck for 10 years. I'm on EB2, EB3. Uh, what can I do? When will I ever get my green card? What do you tell people? Um, well, if I had an answer to that question, uh, we would be the largest firm in the country um, starting tomorrow. But uh, I, I think one of the things you could do, say, for example, is if you're stuck in EB3, which is the third preference category, it's got the longest wait line. Uh, if you're uh, from, from a, some of the restricted uh, backgrounds. Um, you could try to go back and get your master's degree um, and try to find a position that requires a master's degree for entry to try to move up to EB2. The other thing you could do is you can go work for uh, the foreign entity uh, that you, that a foreign branch of your current entity, if you're a manager or an executive, gain some experience in that matter in a foreign country. And um, with that background, with that level of experience for a few years, you can come back as an executive or manager with the same company uh, through the L1A route and try to get an, a new green card through EB, EB1 category, which is a much faster track. Um, aside from those few, if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of cash sitting around, you want to start your own business, you can invest that money in the United States under the EB-5 category and start a business in that manner. Uh, that's also another fast track, but I think EB-1 and EB-5, which is manager and executive for EB-1, and EB-5 is the investment base category. The, the, the speed level is the same, so you can go either way. Those are some of the options that I could think of. Um, yeah, I think those are some ways to step up on the EB category to get your green card faster. Okay, so there's a question on uh, if I sell my company in India, what is the tax impact? So who wants to take that? Kisle, I have a company in India, I sold tax impact. Uh, the tax impact will be capital gain nominee. Uh, so India law uh, would require uh, to do some TDS withholding. And uh, uh, based on the TDS withholding, 
you may want to file tax returns in India. And being a U.S. citizen, I'm assuming this uh, person is a U.S. person or U.S. company. Uh, they also have to include their worldwide income in the U.S. And of course, they can take the foreign tax credit for taxes paid in India. Jamin, you have a few questions. Go ahead. Sure. Thanks, Navneet. Um, these are from the app. Um, so the, the first one discusses um, that uh, I'll just read the question. We're a social enterprise, a U.S. social enterprise initially launching in India while seeking to collaborate with established Indian entities. I'm told we are at risk because our NDA will not be recognized. How can we protect our long-term goals and continue to seek collaboration? One of my co-founders is in India. So um, the, the, the NDA is usually, um, obviously it's a country specific. Um, and uh, when we're signing these in the U.S., it's going to uh, be valid in the U.S. only. So I would recommend, um, you know, getting one done in India if the majority of the transactions that are taking place are in India. Um, and there's, a, there's another question there about a regulatory requirement for a virtual clinic in U.S. managed by doctors in India. I think um, that's uh, probably a little bit uh, involved in terms of the uh, that the tax and um, the legal regulations um, and uh, certainly the, the the tax on services. So um, please reach out to us and we can we can kind of guide you through that. And the last question was, uh, can we know some reliable service providers who can offload the legal compliance responsibilities uh, off the shoulders of an aspiring entrepreneur at reasonable, predictable costs in India? Yeah, absolutely. Um, as Kisley has written in here, we have offices in India. So we happy to uh, connect you with our team there and they can certainly um they're they're well versed in india uh, compliance and can help you with that thank you navneet so navneet i have a um, uh, point to add on the questions that you asked me uh, so once you have uh, let's say stock option plan set up then you also need to get done valuation every year and uh, there is a code section in IRS called 409A, and 409A would require you to uh, offer the stocks at the fair value to your um, uh, employees and your uh, other consultants. And uh, I, this code section would also require you to do the valuation every year. Within 12 months, you need to renew this um, uh, valuation. So I just wanted to add this uh, very important item. And, and as a form, uh, I wanted to tell audience that we uh, do a lot of uh, for an evaluation and, and happy to help. Yeah, so we have a question uh, that somebody is living in India, an Indian citizen. Uh, can I start a company in Delaware? Uh, this is one of the reasons why US is what is why US is what it is. Uh, you can be living in India, you can have a corporation set up in all 50 states of the United States. There are no stringent requirements like there are in India and other countries that you have to have a director that lives in the United States, not a requirement that you have to have two shareholders like in India, not a requirement in US that one of the directors needs to be living in United States, not a requirement, nothing. You can start a company, you can have a Delaware company. Uh, most of the times a Delaware company is not required but you know how everybody goes to Las Vegas, so everybody goes to Las Vegas. Uh, but if you're so uh, determined to have a Delaware company, then okay, go ahead, have a Delaware company and have a subsidiary in India. Very little hurdles, very little additional legal help required, very little. Uh, like for instance, we charge less than $3,000 a year to maintain a Delaware entity to do the corporate minutes. To, to do the annual filing, to do the tax return uh, in Delaware uh, and any other state that you're operating in, given that if you don't have a whole bunch of income. So it's, it's very little uh, required. And unlike India, the US does not punish people that don't comply with requirements. As long as there is no fraud or cheating, the US is very lenient. And you can, two years later, you can cry a little and they forgive and forget everything. And, give you a fresh start. So go for it. Now, need if I may add, uh, for many of the companies, you know, what we have seen where we have helped the companies where the founder was sitting in India, everything was great. And some of the time they came from other service providers and they were not able to open up the bank account. It seems very simple process, but 
over the years what we have learned and now we have built up a relationship with the banks and we are happy to say we can even help with opening the bank accounts which many of our clients are not able to do while sitting in india thank you right yeah that's one hurdle that you guys have figured out how to overcome um so let's talk about uh, m and a transactions so what about due diligence um have any of you helped with financial tax corporate employment immigration due diligence uh yes now we need multiple uh, such uh, and we keep doing every year um i think in the last 20 30 years we have done hundreds of them uh, many million dollar transactions and we do uh tax accounting audit uh, legal immigration due diligence everything uh, a, comp- a buyer seller need be we can do all those things sounds good um and uh, i believe if there is a legal due diligence and if you show up with a corporate lawyer and employment lawyer and immigration lawyer and cpas and you sit across the table i believe uh, we can cut down the costs of a normal due diligence because half of the cost of the normal due, due due diligence is the cpa talking to the lawyer and the lawyer talking to the cpa and trying to understand information uh let's go to the next question so uh kirti this goes to you uh about o visa and i always joke that o visa is a 15 page letter to the government of the united states and if you have your life so involved and so accomplished that it takes 15 pages to write about your life then that's what's required to get an o visa is that true um requirements for an o visa are um are are pretty much uh, a, a massive resume uh like you said a 15 page letter uh to the government explaining uh what what's required for you to get the visa but i think the the uscis website does a very good job of listing out the requirements you know you, you can meet the requirement by getting something uh that is a nationally recognized award such as you know um uh, a nobel peace prize or something to that extent then i don't know if you're looking for a visa anyways because you can potentially live anywhere um but i i think the the key thing to remember of the other categories that are listed on the website is that you have to demonstrate that um this is something that's unique to you and I, and i think the key to it is into experience and experience if you try to rush that visa you're less likely to get it so the, the key thing to focus on is build up your resume build up your um build up your career try to get as much uh publications out there for yourself as much as possible preferably in scientific or um depending on your on your field that type of um publications would be the most helpful the more peer read you are the better it will be um and and the key is to just focus on developing your career this visa is it's just added on top but if you try to target the visa by the requirements listed on it you're less likely to obtain it at that point and what a great visa no lca no wage requirement no quota yes no 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 wait requirements uh, no quotas uh, just like uh, h1b's get locked up every year and you have to wait till april every year to get a chance to get a crack at a new one and uh the restrictions are far fewer such as you mentioned the no lca is required meaning no prevailing wage no no um no audit files that must be kept so the employer is not overburdened with the amount of uh, documentation that goes with the uh, h and l and other types of non immigrant visas right i remember uh, doing a self petitioning o visa uh, starting a company and and start self petitioning so that worked so that's another good thing with an o visa you can self petition okay so uh jamin let's go to you um one of the uh, things i learned from thai about 15 years ago is that we had a speaker um ali from uh, silicon valley and he told me uh he was giving a speech on how to fire people and terminate employees and he said something that uh is very important i feel that he said um 
rule number one, make sure all your employment handbook is being followed. And if it says you must be, keep, put people on a PIP and put them on probation before firing, then follow those rules. There is no law that you have to put an employee on a PIP. But if you put that in your handbook, now you've created a law for yourself that you must follow. So he says, follow, follow all the laws that you've created for yourself in your uh, employee handbook. And then second, uh, which I, is the important thing he said, he said to avoid problems in HR world, the termination must not come as a surprise to the employee, which means that you should have had a conversation with this employee. You should put notes in their HR file, performance appraisals, uh, anything they messed up on added uh, to their HR file after they you get hired them then in conversations you will find out that uh, they never worked at starbucks and you remember that their resume said they worked at starbucks so you make a note of that uh, and important to defend uh, employee lawsuits is to see if there's a lie on their resume but he the thing that he said that surprised me the most is that every time I fire an employee, I take them out to lunch and have a conversation with them and say, hey, I really like you, but the, you're not a right fit. The company is not a fit for you. Take 50% of the blame that the employer is not a good fit for you. There's many other employers that'll be better for you out there. And, uh, and, uh, and he said that I want to terminate an employee and while, while I'm having lunch and terminating them, I'm thinking this person needs to remain my friend for life. That's how cordially and nicely you do the whole, whole uh, transaction. So you've done, uh, Jamin, a lot of employee investigations for companies. Uh, what have you learned that employers are not doing right that they could do better? Yeah, that's a great question and, and great tips from, um, from, from your, from your uh, story. Um, so one thing that um, that usually sticks out is uh, in the employee handbook, there's usually an acknowledgement that there's an acknowledgement page at the end for the employee to sign. Um, if the onboarding is not done correctly, or if it's a um, you know, new HR person or, or it's a new company, sometimes they forget to get that acknowledgement. So then it's difficult for the employer to say down the line in an EEOC complaint that um, that the employee received the handbook when they never actually did without showing that there was uh, an acknowledgement of the receipt of the handbook. And, and kind of what I mentioned, um, all the policies and, um, you know, the, the laws that you said you create for yourself, um, uh, the anti-discrimination, anti-harassment, zero tolerance for any of those items, those are key. Um, and, and so a lot of times, uh, uh, I think what I see in, in these investigations is that the, the companies are um, uh, they are following the rule to a certain degree for certain employees. So I think my advice there is, is follow the rules that you've set out for yourself in the handbook uh, or in the contract or whatever it is and, and follow it uniformly across the board. Don't pick and choose um, the employees that you're going to um, you know, apply it to just because they're a pro problematic employee, but it has to be kind of, um, you know, across the board, especially, um, you know, we live in a litigious society. So um, it, it's uh, the employees are very quick to, um, to, to file suit against their employer, unless they have a friend for life, as you mentioned. Um, and, and correctly, again, um, you know, documentation of, uh, all, of all the interactions of performance discussions, whether it's verbal and if it's a verbal um, conversation that you have with the employee saying that, hey, you know, um, you, you blew this deadline or whatever the case is, follow it up with an email. Um, you know, he said, she said in, in these types of situations is um, both sides lose on that. So the written warnings should be provided or if it's a verbal, then follow up with an email and consider the PIP, um, the performance improvement plan uh, with specific um, uh, goals and deadlines. And, and remember that most of the employees in the US are at will employees. So they can be terminated for any reason or no reason as a, at all, as long as it's not a discriminatory reason. And if it's performance related, tell them that. And um, you know, there's statutory um, separation notices that, the, that your state government will provide. Um, and uh, and have another uh, HR person or a manager or the owner um, present during the the termination conversation. Great. 
So Ramesh, I have a multi-state tax question for you. I remember uh, many, many years ago, I was young and naive and uh, we had a IT service company as a client and um, we were filing a federal return and we were filing a California return and then comes along a buyer and the buyer says, hey, we wanna buy you and write you a big check. So we said, okay. And then uh, this is when I didn't have any gray hair. And then the buyer says, hey, wait a minute, you didn't file tax return in other states. And I said, what do you mean other states? We're a California company. Why am I filing tax return in other states? And he says, what do you mean? You have revenue from other states. How come you filed a federal return in California return? And then you had revenue in Texas and you had revenue in the state of Washington and, and New York. What about those start state tax returns? You're supposed to allocate your 20 million of revenue in other states and sorry, go ahead and fix it and then we'll come by you. I'm like, what? So then of course I find out that you have to allocate revenue that you derive from every state and every state and every land and every county and every city in the country says you were on our land, so you pay taxes here. So we of course carved up and went back several years and filed several tax returns and paid uh, taxes and interest and penalties. So what is the deal? What do we have to do, Ramesh? Yes, so Namrit, uh, with regard to the multi-state taxes, uh, so uh, if the company has a nexus in uh, any state, uh, then they are required to file taxes. And then the way you create the nexus is uh, either you are having employee in that state, having office, uh, uh, and uh, now I think few states uh, have come up with the like economic uh, nexus. So if you have like you know, the sales uh, more than certain threshold, then you are also required to file taxes. So so once you have a nexus, then you are required to allocate the federal taxable income within all those states uh, based on the three factor. Uh, they look at the three factor. One is the sales, uh, payroll, and uh, rent and property. So average of those three factor, they use to allocate the federal taxable income and uh, pay the taxes on the uh, various state. Okay, Kapil. Um, so I have an IT company and then my wife has a, a, a travel company and uh, then I'm an investor in a restaurant in town. Should I do all of them through one company or should I form a separate company for each one of these businesses? Sure, Navneet, we get this question asked many times and uh, one simple answer for that is keep all the entities, it should be one entity per business, even when we are filing the tax returns, you know, IRS very specifically asked what type of business it is that you're filing the tax return for. And it's not like in the same tax return, I'm having a real estate business and I'm a restaurant business. So, and that is from the taxation perspective. And again, more from legal perspective, as you all know, is again, uh, if something goes wrong, one, one business is down and somebody gets sued for one particular business, then the person who is suing, he can come, he or she can come after all the businesses because now you have all the assets sitting in within one business rather than uh, you know, kind of sitting in different businesses, which you could have avoided if you could have separated each entity, that's where, you know, whenever it's just doing the thing right at the time of the setup, which sometimes doesn't happen in real world. But yeah, one, one simple solution is keep particular one single LLC, one single escort, whatever you choose, whatever type of business you use, but keep it separate per business. Okay, great. So Kisle, I want to, I've made a lot of money, uh, sold my company. Now I want to start a nonprofit organization. Uh, do I set up a nonprofit as a partnership, as a sole proprietorship? Do I start to, do I need to do a company and how do I make it nonprofit? And do I pay taxes on the net income of the nonprofit? What do I have to do? And then I want to do a nonprofit in India also. So what should I do? Um, very good question, Navneet. So, uh, the best way to do is to open a corporation, uh, set up the company as a non-profit corporation. Uh, for example, if you are in California, you would register in California with Secretary of State, take federal ID number, prepare some other documents like bylaws and 
uh, and then apply with IRS for tax exemption. That is the most important thing. Once IRS gives you the tax exemption letter, that is mostly under section 501c3, then you can start accepting, uh, the nonprofit can start accepting donations or uh, charitable contributions, and they can start giving the receipt to their, uh, those donors. And those donors can claim those uh, donations on their, their personal taxes. And, uh, and this nonprofit company, they can file the return, they have to file the return every year with IRS and state, and they do not have to pay any tax, uh, all the taxes, taxes are exempt. And they can, uh, if they're non-profit company in India, they can they can send the money to uh, India to their counterpart or other non-profit organizations. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Um, so, Kirti, what happened to EB five, the million dollar green card that you invest a million bucks and within seven months you get a temporary green card and after two years, they look at your investment of a million and see that you've hired 10 employees and you get a green card. I hear that it's a mess now that it's now 1.8 million and not one. And instead of seven months, it's taking seven years. Is that true? Well, um, yes, there's part of it's true. Part of it is a, a little bit of rumors, but uh, so just I, I believe it was the end of last year uh, they increased the amount that's necessary to invest uh, as you mentioned that it's gone up significantly almost doubled from the previous levels of 500 to a million um, so what's what's going on is that there's processing delays in almost every visa you apply for right now and um, EB5 is no different and when the um, when the whole process in itself also took a little while to get set up, you had to set up a company, you had to transfer the money, you had to trace back all the sources, and then you didn't have to transfer all of it. Part of it was fine, but you, then you file a petition based on that. The petition would take a little while to get approved. Once it was approved, you get an entry visa stamp, you come in, and then you grow your business. But just getting to that part of getting an entry visa stamped and getting that petition approved is now taking a couple of years. Um, and it's kind of hard for people to be able to manage and start and grow a business, transfer the money and have it sit here while you're waiting for a visa for that long. Two years is quite a bit to, and then you're gonna have to hire people here to do it. And you know what they say, if you want to do something right, you have to do it yourself. And if you're, people aren't comfortable necessarily to be uh, handing the starting of a new business to somebody else to get it started. So that, that, that's kind of where the trouble is right now. Um, but I think there are ways around it. If you have a partner that you wanted to partner up in the U.S. with anyways, make those relationships um, where we live in a digital world, get a partner involved, get them going, get the visa started know that, you know, uh, plan your business in a way that you know you're gonna take a few years to get there in the first place. So get the partner involved, get the business started in the US, get it going, it'll take a couple of years, but you'll get your visa. Um, US won't deny anybody coming in with a lot of money in their pockets and creating a lot of jobs. So get that going and um, once the business is set up, get the money in, it'll take a few years. Once you get here, you can go ahead and expand it. Great, thank you. Uh, so, Jamin uh, in Atlanta. So, Jamin, uh, it's we understand that uh, to avoid liability, don't operate like a sole proprietor. Don't operate in partnership, and always have an umbrella on you that covers you, and and that is to do a corporation or an LLC. But we all know that at times, the owners of these corporations get sued, and the corporation doesn't protect them and does not give them the liability shield that they're looking for. All of this because of the concept known as piercing the corporate veil, where the owners are held responsible and the corporate structure is ignored. And uh, can you tell us how a corporation veil gets pierced and what is the meaning of alter ego? Yeah, absolutely. It's a good question. So um, we usually um, tell the, uh, our clients this at, at early stage startups um, to make sure that they don't get into and fall into this alter ego trap. So essentially, um, kind of what Kapil mentioned earlier, 
um, and, and it goes along those lines. But um, the corporation is essentially an entity in itself. And so if you as a, an individual um, use the funds that are uh, a part of the entity uh, that's supposed to be for business use for personal gain, um, or, and essentially the court will say that there was a uh, the interest and ownership of the corporation and the person are essentially the same that they can't be separated out and um, it's a it's a very fact specific um, uh, thing but um, uh, essentially there would be uh, they, they call it a corporate fiction that there's no separate entity um, meaning that there's no separate business and person but the they're one and the same and they were uh, promoted to um, commit fraud or some sort of injustice against uh, the other parties. Um, there, there are several, I think there's probably like 15 factors that the courts may consider, um, but undercapitalization, uh, commingling of funds, um, uh, failure to observe corporate formalities, uh, loans to and from the corporation without su sufficient consideration. Those are, those are the, the big ticket items that the courts will look at. Um, the undercapitalization is, is pretty straightforward. We kind of have a thumb rule of uh, use a use a couple of months of operating income, keep it in the bank account, have separate bank accounts for each of your separate companies. Um, and and just kind of a, a side note, when if you have partners as well, I would I would uh, take the time to have a proper partnership uh, agreement um, or operating agreement, bylaws, whatever your corporate structure is, to make sure that these types of things don't happen. You have the checks and balances. Yeah, that's a good point, Jamin, uh, and that happens often is people, when they form a partnership with someone, they somehow know that they have to do a partnership agreement. But with the same partner, if they enter into an LLC or a C-Corp or an S-Corp, they forget to do a partnership agreement. They, for, they forget that the corporation is just a, a form of ownership, but the understanding between the partners, the roles, the duties, the responsibilities, the benefits, the buyouts, those need to be covered in a quote unquote partnership agreement. And of course, in the corporation world, we just call it a shareholders agreement instead of a partnership agreement. And I would think a majority of people forget to do that. Uh, and then at the beginning of the relationship, obviously things are very hunky-dory and everybody's feeling optimistic. Um, I remember a client, there were four partners and I told them that, hey, let's do a partnership agreement and uh, we, since we're not a partnership, we're in a corporation, let's do a shareholders agreement. And one of them says to me, he says, that's not gonna happen, let's not do it. I said, why not? He says, we'll have such a big fight over it, defining roles, duties, responsibilities, buyout. And I said, you think you can have a fight doing the agreement? What do you think is gonna happen when you actually have a fight and there is no agreement? You think we're gonna enter into an agreement then but they didn't listen. Anyways, which was good for us. A few years later, there was a lawsuit, so we made a lot of money. So that's fine. Um, so, uh, Kisle, um, so I did a company, I did stock options. Now my friend tells me I need a 409 valuation. What the heck is that? I, I told you earlier, Namit, 409A is an IRS code section, which uh, says that if you're offering stocks to your employees or consultant, then it should be based on the fair market value. And uh, this, all these things are governed by section 409A, uh, which means that company has to do, um, based on the guideline of 409A valuation every year. Uh, and once the valuation is done, it is valid for 12 months. After 12 months, I have to do it again? After 12 months, yes, you have to do it again. All right. So Satya has formed a subsidiary in India and I'm sending some work to India and India is doing some work for me. And then I get audited and the auditor says, show me the transfer pricing agreement between your US company and Indian company. And I had never heard that before. What is that and do I need one? Yeah, sure. Uh, so basically the transfer pricing agreement is uh, an agreement between these uh, two entities which are related parties. Uh, basically, we need to say that uh, we are following arm's length price of, uh, for the charges between the related party tra uh, transactions. Uh, so, US has certain rules um, uh, for preparation of that transfer pricing agreement, uh, yeah, but India has more uh, 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 
uh, stringent rules and we have to file a transfer pricing agreement with authorities as well. And uh, we need to follow some methods to arrive at an arm's length price. Uh, so it's always, always better to keep a transfer pricing agreement. Uh, otherwise, if there is an audit, uh, if, there is an, if uh, IRS feels that uh, price is not at arm's length basis, then uh, taxes would be levied, which is huge and uh, interest and penalties also. And do you know if my Indian company also needs a transfer pricing agreement? Uh, yes, Indian company, actually Indian company needs transfer pricing agreement and that is a requirement as per the Indian regulations and you need to file that transfer pricing agreement with authorities on regular, on annual basis. Okay. Uh, so Jamin, back to you. I've heard that if I have over 50 employees, I'm now subject to a new law, FMLA, uh, with stringent requirements. Uh, what is FMLA? Yeah, so the Family Medical Leave Act um, was enacted uh, about 20 plus years ago, and uh, essentially it was uh, it, it was applicable to uh, employers um, uh, to provide for certain leave benefits. And now um, during the pandemic, um, they've expanded it with the Families First uh, Coronavirus, Coronavirus Response Act. It's a mouthful. So FFCRA. And so the FFCRA essentially now applies to uh, employees that are uh, the employers that have less than 50 employees. And um, there's uh, several different aspects of it um, in terms of providing leave for certain employees that, um, and, and it's actually a, a paid leave that the employees would get um, if they had to care for their child or if they had to care for um, a family member that was tested positive for coronavirus um, and, and that type of thing. So there's certain different um, thresholds for how much they get paid, but essentially um, you as, a, as an employer would have to pay your employee if they got coronavirus or they had to take care of a, a spouse um, for two weeks. And uh, if they uh, received, um, and that's if they're a full-time employee, if they're a part-time employee, then two thirds, I believe. And uh, the other part of it is that if the daycare of schools closed, then they get up to um, uh, an additional 10 weeks. Uh, two, the first two um, are uh, unpaid and then the 10 would be paid. So um, there's a certain, um, uh, th there's some sort of uh, laws that are, that are in the pipeline to protect uh, uh, employers that have less than uh, 25 employees because it, it could cause a, a financial hardship. So that's kind of in the works. And um, uh, if you do have less than 25, then uh, certainly, um, you know, uh, apply for the hardship to see if you, you know, can get out of uh, making those particular payments to the employees. Okay, wonderful. So uh, let's stay in Atlanta and ask Kapil a tax question. So Kapil, I, I have a hotel that I bought for a million dollars and I'm selling it for two and I have a gain of $1 million and I'm gonna have to pay a lot of taxes. My real estate broker tells me, hey, buy uh, another hotel uh, for $2 million and you will not have to pay uh, the tax. Um, using some 1031 or something. Uh, can you tell us what that is? Yeah, sure, Navneet, great question. Yeah, we, we come across this uh, good problem many times because our clients are, again, they buy and sell motels and they have made a lot of money over the years. And uh, yeah, so there's a 1031, what happens as, going back to your question, million dollar, there's a million dollar gain sitting. So you can buy another similar real estate within six months of period. And if you buy and close that transition within six months of that period, then your kind of a million dollar was a buying price for the first property you sold for two. And now let's suppose you bought it for three, another property. So your basis kind of carries over to the new property. So that's, and then again, it's a tax deferment. They can keep on doing it as, as long as they want. Eventually when they sell it at the last end, they will have to, pay the gain at that time, but over the years they keep on doing it. But uh, for that, they have to use a 1031 qualified intermediary. So whenever they do that, they need to speak with us beforehand. So sometimes what happens, clients come, if they were working with some other professionals, they're like, yeah, we want to do that. 
And for to their surprise, they cannot just think of this after doing the transaction. They have to plan ahead and they cannot be touching the money. So if they are doing a transaction, the money needs to go into the escrow account, which is held by the qualified intermediary, who's a 1035 uh, qualified intermediary, and then take it forward. But again, if anybody is trying to do that, uh, two senses, please approach us, contact us beforehand, and we can save them a lot of money. Thank you. Wonderful. So uh, we get asked uh, this question a lot. Uh, people in the United States have companies and then they start a company in India or have employees in India or find freelancers and consultants in India that do work for the US company. And the US company now wants to write a check, wire a check, mail a check uh, to India to pay for these services, either to a subsidiary or an affiliate or a freelancer. And then they wonder, how do you write it off? Where's the W-2? Where's the 1099? And uh, we have a shocking answer for you. Ramesh, what do we do? Yes, yeah, so uh, if a uh, US company pays to uh, India company or even a uh, foreign uh, freelancer, uh, yeah, company, US company can pay to them. Uh, and in return, US company should collect uh, the withholding assumption form is called uh, uh, w 8 ben So if, if uh, foreign company provide that, uh, foreign company or the even foreign freelancer provide that uh, form, sign form to US company, then there is no withholding here in US. And a US company write off that as an expense, like a subcontracting expense on the US company's books. And no tax? No tax here. And because the services, yeah, uh, because the services are performed in the, in India or the overseas. So, Kisle, I can send a hundred million dollars to India, and IRS doesn't care. Uh, yes, Navneet, because this is not effectively uh, uh, earned income in the U.S. This income is supposed to have earned in, in India as long as those services are provided from India, not in the U.S. And they, these are uh, these things are very well defined in the India U.S. tax treaty. So, uh, yeah, no worries. Yeah, the, with regard to the reporting, uh, Navneet, uh, uh, instead of a 1099 form, there is a, another form called 1042. So at the end of the year, US company needs to file that form with the IRS, notifying the IRS that, okay, this is the uh, foreign company or the foreign freelancer to whom we have uh, paid this much amount as a, as a uh, subcontracting services to overseas. So yeah, so that is a reporting requirement on 1042. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, Jamin, clients often call and uh, say that, hey, I got a corporation. So, because the state of California gave me the name, state of Delaware gave me the name, I automatically have a trademark, right? I don't need to do anything. And then they write a software and they feel they wrote the software and they don't need a copyright. Can you tell us what is the difference between a trademark copyright patent? Absolutely, yeah. So um, there's a, there's a couple of ways to go and and, and file for it. Um, there's a common law right um, for these particular um, inventions um, or the the logos or the phrases, but um, to actually put it out there for the public. Um, so so the copyright is essentially um, a, a creative or intellectual work um, such as music, um, and uh, and that's governed by the Library of Congress. Trademarks are more for names, phrases, um, uh, brand names, logos, that type of thing. And that's governed um, by the United States Patent and Trademark Office, which, um, as the name suggests, also governs the patents. Um, and so the patents uh, uh, cover novel ideas, um, or, and the, there are several different types of patents. There's a provisional patent, which is a, a, a placeholder, essentially, for one year, uh, which the, the applicant must file the a utility patent um, within one year of that filing of the provisional, and um, we, we do a lot of these uh, a lot of these IP applications um, trademarks more than any others uh, because of the the logos and things. And so um, right now it's taking a little bit longer than it has in the past uh, because of the pandemic, um, but it certainly um, you know it could take anywhere from um, an average of about six months to about eighteen months to get a uh, a trademark or a patent. Uh, approved 
and uh, much, much shorter for a copyright though. Okay. So, so Kapil, I have a bank account in India. Should I keep it? Should I close it? Do I need to report it to IRS that I have a bank account in India? And yeah, again, uh, I mean, great question. And I think that's what we have learned a lot from you and again, from practice as well. You know, once anybody who is here in US living here, working here, earning money here, there is no business whatsoever that that person should be keeping the bank account. One simple solution is because simple reason is, again, you tend to file tax returns if needed in India, you have to, again, uh, you know, do the reporting, whatever is there, because you are a US citizen or green card holder or a tax resident in US, you need to report global income. So again, uh, you have to be really complying with that. And uh, the sad part is, you know, a lot of our clients, you know, let's suppose they did a hundred thousand dollar fixed deposit in India, maybe six, seven years ago. And even though they were earning a return in Indian rupees of seven, eight percent, they brought the money back. So instead of hundred thousand dollars, they bring it back as 90,000. The sad part again is because the dollar appreciates. So uh, the, we tell the clients, you know, why don't you just put the money wherever they want, wherever they can have an alternative and just put it money maybe in index funds. Again, you are betting on the long story of US, which we know, you know, in the long run, uh, we have seen in the history, it, will, it is bound to do good. So maybe content with the five, six, seven percent that we get in index return funds. And again, you are betting in favor of dollar, which you cannot go wrong, which history has suggested us. But yeah, I think uh, there is no business unless they want that return to be earned and maybe five years, 10 years down the road, they are planning to settle down in back in India and spend that money in India. But uh, we have seen most of the people they think, but I think maybe one out of thousand people actually make that move. So if that is the case, so, you know, if history teaches us something, you know, bring all your assets back home, which is your US is your home and invest the money in here, use the money, whatever you buy, real estate, whatever. But, uh, you know, you cannot go wrong for the most part. And how do I sell my parents' home in India and how do I get the money here and do I have to pay taxes? Yeah, I think uh, selling again, uh, you know, in India, as we know, there's a big uh, kind of a margin when somebody is trying to buy or sell, you know, there are two different pricing that comes to market, but good luck with that. You need to be having a good broker and uh, hopefully you are able to sell that once you sell that property, uh, you know, uh, as long as you are bringing the money up to $100,000, there is no requirement whatsoever. And if you bring more than $100,000 in a year, there's a give tax return form in the 3520. We just need to do and file that form with the IRS. And if it's an inherited property, then you just don't pay tax, but there's a compliance that needs to be done. Uh, but yeah, that can be done. And uh, we have done that for many, many clients. Great. Um, so Satya, you do a lot of uh, living trust. Do I have to be rich to get a trust done? Uh, isn't there like $10 million or something there is no tax on? Do I still need a trust? What do you advise people with uh, less than 10 million or more than 10 million? And is that 10 million per person or uh, a husband and wife have double of that? Yeah, so living trust, uh, uh, we recommend everyone, every family in the US uh, who has at least a property uh, uh, to get a living trust done. So this is basically to avoid probate if tomorrow something happens, uh, uh, the assets and custody of the child will go to um, uh, court. So again, it depends on the state to state uh, requirement. Uh, so we recommend uh, to get the living trust done irrespective of the how many properties in one, one have. Uh, even a property, even a bank, uh, bank balance, that should be sufficient. And uh, to take care of uh, uh, the properties and uh, you, can, you can very well determine whom to go and how this uh, property is to be transferred to your kids. So that is, that is one of the thing. And uh, as far as uh, 10 million is concerned, uh, the 10 million is a, a gift tax exemption limit uh, for each person over a lifetime. So for a couple, it is uh, 20, 20 million. Uh, so that is altogether different. Uh, so when, when, when someone gets a gift um, uh, for more than $20 million, then donor has to pay gift tax. So this limit is applicable for that. But living trust, uh, we, we would recommend everyone to get it. 
Beautiful. Thank you. Okay, folks. Thank you so much. We we'll one last question and then we're done. Jamin, uh, you see the question on patents and software and copyrights, trademarks. Yes, Namit. So um, it, it depends on the software itself. If it's a novel software um, or if it's creating something new, uh, it really depends on it. Uh, I can't give a blanket yes or no. Um, and uh, they should file. Um, they should actually file with the Library of Congress or the USPTO rather than. Um, uh, leaving it out for uh, for common law rights. Uh, the the reason why those um, uh, facilities exist is to put all the other uh, competitors on notice. So uh, that's uh, that that's uh, that should cover that. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and I hope uh, you continue to stay safe and well, and take care of yourself and your families. And uh, forget about COVID. It, figure out a way to conquer it. This too shall pass. Um, and then a year or two from now, we'll look back. And these are the times when uh, big companies get started. So stay at it and uh, we shall all recover and conquer. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks everyone.